Let me introduce our uh, guest speaker uh, from Amsterdam, Netherlands, uh, who is direct, a professor of law, intellectual property, and uh, director of institute uh, called Institute of Information Law at Amsterdam University. And uh, with this lecture, we uh, start a new uh, uh, program, a multi multidisciplinary program at uh, Open University Skoko, uh, which is, would be devoted to uh, intellectual property agenda, uh, improvement of uh, uh, intellectual property regime here in Russia to boost innovation, not to stifle uh, its growth and development. Uh, yes, and we welcome uh, all of you here. Uh, I would just uh, say a couple of words in, uh, yeah, to mention the context in which uh, this lecture is given and uh, uh, in which this project, this uh, initiative is launched, uh, is that uh, currently maybe if you follow a bit uh, Russian politics you could uh, hear a recent uh, uh, speech of the President Putin at uh, the Council for Modernization and uh, Development uh, uh, at the Presidential Office uh, of Russian Federation where he mentions that uh, the current regime of IP rights protection is not optimal and is not optimal to uh, redistribute wealth and to redistribute and to uh, set uh, uh, to set incentives properly uh, for innovative companies uh, to build new products and for uh, entrepreneurs to launch new businesses and for uh, state for the government itself, uh, to, which is a major sponsor of uh, uh, research and development here in Russia. Uh, I would say maybe uh, in many spheres it's the only sponsor, it's the only source of uh, funding for research and development. And he mentioned also that uh, the way uh, IP rights on this uh, intellectual uh, results is this uh, products produced uh, uh, produced uh, on <coughs> government in government domain by uh, sponsored by government uh, uh, are not distributed properly so we have to think how to move forward to make it more optimal uh, professor Hugenholz had a, uh, a broad experience in in the sphere of uh, understanding uh, uh, how intellectual property regime influence uh, development uh, what is it what does it mean uh, in a modern age and age of information technologies uh, widespread and age of uh, we call it post industrial society uh, modern society and society uh, economy of knowledge economy of uh, entrepreneurship and so on uh, and uh, uh, Professor Hugo has also drafted a number of uh, recommendations for European Commission, which is uh, 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 currently uh, uh, trying to realize and to to propose a roadmap uh, for development of IP regime in Europe uh, for purposes of uh, boosting innovation and uh, development of uh, European economy. So that's uh, my short uh, uh, introduction. So I. I will give a uh, uh, microphone to Professor Hungenholz, uh, who will start uh, this interesting lecture. Thank you. Thank you. I actually don't need a microphone, <laughs> because I already have one. Um, maybe we can keep it here. Thank you for that. Uh, can you all hear me? Yeah. yeah. Thank you for that introduction, and uh, thank you uh, for inviting me to the uh, Skolkovo Open University. It's a big honor for me to speak here in Moscow. Um, and I apologize particularly to the people in the back for not speaking Russian. I'm really sorry about that. Um, on the other hand, I'm not speaking Dutch either, which is my native tongue, so it's a compromise solution that I speak in English. Um, the uh, topic of my talk is uh, as you can see on the first slide, intellectual property versus open access. I thought that would be a, an interesting topic for anyone studying at the uh, Skolkovo Open University. I understand most of you are uh, from the uh, technical or scientific field. Not many of you are lawyers, actually. Uh, but of course, you're all in some way involved in intellectual property, and uh, you may uh, be interested in, uh, in looking at it from a somewhat critical perspective. Uh, 
I'm sure all of you have also heard about open access or open content, open source. What I would like to talk about today is juxtaposing these two things to compare them and see what, what they have in common and what the differences are. Um, and I also would like to show that each system, intellectual property and open access, has uh, its positives and its negatives. Um, and I'll be very objective about this. So um, this is actually my uh, outline. I hope we have time enough. I will start with a brief introduction of what intellectual property is. And when I say, when you see IP on the slide, that is intellectual property. Um, I will explain where it may work well. And I will explain other areas where it doesn't work well, where it even works really badly. And then I will also show some areas where it's actually totally unnecessary. After that introduction, critical evaluation of intellectual property, uh, we will move to open access or, because these terms are not exactly the same, open content, open source, open access, open data. I will explain to you what these things are and how they work well in some areas and perhaps not so well in others. And then I have some conclusions. Uh, I hope uh, after that to hear from you. This is an open university and with an open university comes uh, openness to questions. So if you have questions afterwards, I'd be very happy to uh, answer them. And if during this uh, lecture you have questions where you need clarification, please do not be afraid to raise your hand. I am open to questions all the time. Um, so let's start with what intellectual property actually is. I'm sure most of you have a feeling what it is and some of them have, of you have experience. Maybe some of you have even already filed for patents, for instance. Um, roughly intellectual property law is a collection of different laws, different rights that are not exactly the same. They are often confused, but they are they need to be distinguished. Um, there's copyright, also known as author's right, which protects creations in the cultural field, like novels, musical composition, but also software can be subject to a copyright. Then there are patents, and you're probably more familiar with patents, patents for novel inventions. Lesser known are plant variety rights. They look a bit like patents, but they're not patents. They are for novel, innovative plants, basically. We do that a lot in the Netherlands. I come from a country that is proud of developing new tulips or new potatoes even. And for that, you can file a plant variety right. It's a bit like a patent for plants. Not every country has this, by the way. Another sort of intellectual property, design right or design protection. It is a bit like a patent and it's a bit like a copyright. It's somewhere in between and it basically protects the new designs of useful articles like a chair or a table or a laptop. Even clothes, new fashion can be subject to a design right. Another example of intellectual property, database right. This is relatively new. Um, it was introduced in Europe in the 1990s and it's also spread to other parts of the world, including Russia has a database right. It's not copyright, it looks a bit like copyright, but it is for investment in gathering large amounts of data into a collection. So a database producer can also have intellectual property in data sets, basically. There's another form of intellectual property, but it's a bit different. Trademark. Trademark protects not the content of an intellectual production, but it protects the signs under which services and goods are being offered on the market. Brands, Coca-Cola, you know the story. We're not going to talk about trademarks today. We're going to talk mostly about copyright and patents. 
and a bit about the others. So why is intellectual property uh, important? Well, there are many, many reasons, and I will show you some of the aims of the system. But I can tell you in advance, even if, it's n if you're not convinced by any of this, even if you believe intellectual property serves no purpose at all, you'll have to know about it, because since Russia has acceded to the WTO, the World Trade Organization, there is an international obligation to respect intellectual property. And that covers all these fields. So we'll have to get used to it. I'm sure, of course, in Russia you were already used to it because you already had most of these rights in your national law. But with the TRIPS agreement, which is part of the WTO, every country that is part of that system has to take these rights more seriously than in the past. What are the aims of intellectual property? Why do we have this system? Very often we forget to ask this question. We just assume that we have it. And people tell us that we need it and that we have to defeat pirates and that piracy is bad. But why do we have it? I think it's important to keep asking ourselves this question more basically every time we have discussions about intellectual property. The official reason why we have it, in a nutshell, why we have it in all countries, all developed countries in the world, actually every country in the world now has some form of IP, is to promote the production and the dissemination of culture and knowledge. To act, to serve as an instrument promoting the creation of cultural goods and innovative products. That's the official reason. And you can find this, for instance, written down in the United States Constitution, which has a concept. In the United States, this purpose of intellectual property is in the Constitution for many years already to promote the progress of science and useful arts. In other words, to go back to this slide, we don't have intellectual property simply because it's good for an industry or to make pers uh, the Disney company very rich. The idea is to serve a higher goal, which is to stimulate creators or creative industries, to stimulate inventors or innovative industries to invest in creation, to invest in research and development by giving them exclusive rights. That is the essence of intellectual property. And these rights can then be converted during a limited period into money. The rights are used as a basis for a business model. You can either sell your rights or you can license your rights and get income from those rights. That's the idea, basically, about intellectual property. We create temporary monopolies because we believe that it serves a higher economic, cultural purpose of stimulating creation and invention. Keep that in mind. There are, of course, other reasons as well. One reason which is particularly important in the field of copyright traditionally. It's a bit of an old-fashioned story, but it still holds up, is to protect authors who would otherwise not have a living, to give them sort of a just reward for their creative work. Because we think it's good that authors get some money for the work they do to contribute to society. And then there's another reason which is even less important, but it still needs to be mentioned. There are some people who say, and those are the, the real traditionalists in my field who would say, well, we need to protect authors because in the work that they publish, their personality is reflected. And that is part of their reputation. So we need to protect authors reputation through copyright. We don't want 
authors to be misrepresented. We want their works to be correctly represented by publishers and broadcasters and film producers and what have you. So, in other words, there are different reasons here for protecting intellectual property. But the main one, to promote production and dissemination of cultural and knowledge goods. And that's the Constitution. It's interesting, by the way, if you compare the American Constitution to the EU Constitution called the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, that you will not find this same aim reflected there. In, the, in Europe, in the EU, the Charter basically says, we need to protect intellectual property. It doesn't even say why. I think that's a big mistake. Intellectual property, in my opinion, is never a goal in itself. It should always have a higher purpose to serve society, basically. But the Charter of the EU forgets to mention that. And that's dangerous, by the way. What? Why is James Bond here? We come back to James Bond in just a second. I think some slides have been moved. We'll come back to James Bond, don't worry. Hmm. I think we lost a slide here. We lost the slide. I will do it without the slide. Um, the IP system uh, works and doesn't work. And it works in some fields and it fails in others. I told you that in the introduction. Where intellectual property works fairly well is where you have large upfront investment in a creative product or in innovation that requires recoupment of these, this massive upfront investment through the direct sale of that product. This was on a slide, but it has mysteriously disappeared. Um, and the example here is, of course, a film. You may or may not have gone to the latest James Bond already. It's out for, what is it, two weeks now? Skyfall. Skyfall is a good example of an area where intellectual property works fairly well. Film production. For film production, you really need the incentive of an exclusive right. This industry really does not work without it. Why is that? It is because making a film is an incredibly expensive investment. This movie costs $150 million to make. That's a modest estimate. And without the security of an exclusive right as a reward for that investment, this film production company will never, never again make a movie that expensive. Well, you can say, who cares? We can live without James Bond. Of course we can. But the movie industry generally cannot. Certainly not the big movie industries of Hollywood and Bollywood. I'm sure here and could give better examples here from the Russian movie, movie industry. Requires some exclusivity as the basis of its, uh, of its business model. And this can be explained with this. Um, income sheet here. It's an example of the kind of income streams that a film producer expects to recoup from that massive investment. It's a business. $150 million has to be earned back. How does it do it? Of course, through theatrical sales, basically the cinema. The cinema is still a very important factor for earning money on the basis of a 
film, but it's definitely not the only way. There are ancillary sales there in the second box, and you see it again in the fourth box, that illustrate the importance of intellectual property. Pay cable, network TV revenue, TV syndication, home video, and then again the same for the foreign market. All these services, all these extra forms of making money would not happen without a copyright. If there were no copyright, this film would be immediately available all over the place and you could never earn any money from television or home video and what have you. The business model would collapse without intellectual property. You could, I could give you several other examples where large-scale investment really requires some form of intellectual property protection. Patents in pharmaceuticals is another example, maybe closer to your daily life. Pharmaceutical development of a new medicine very often requires incredible amounts of money. Years and years of research and development accumulating in a patent that temporarily allows a pharmaceutical company to earn back that income sometimes massive investment. And that can be a lot more than $150 million. That could be $500 million. That could be a billion dollars. For those situations where you have large upfront investment and at the same time a constant risk of reproduction, you really need an exclusive right. Otherwise, the system doesn't work. So that's the positive story I need to tell I want to tell you about intellectual property, it really works in some areas and we cannot imagine those areas surviving without some form of, of protection. But you've heard that story before and in fact lobbyists, pro-IP lobbyists are very good in telling you that story over and over and again how important intellectual property is. It's more interesting, I think, to look at the other side of the story where intellectual property does not work or where it needs some correction. And that's the rest of this story. Where IP fails, there are various areas where intellectual property simply does not work. And here's one. If uh, intellectual property becomes too much, too strong, too powerful, too long, too extended, it may actually do the exact opposite of what it is intended to do. It is intended to promote creation, to promote innovation, but overprotection may mean quite the opposite. And when I say overprotection, that is more protection than we really need. And this is not a theoretical problem, because there is a tendency with intellectual property to grow and grow and grow over time. If you look at the history of intellectual property, every year new rights have been added, terms have been expanded, new areas have been become subject to intellectual property. And this is an almost unstoppable tendency uh, which departs from a, the idea that if intellectual property is good, more intellectual property is better. Well, my story here is that there is an optimum, that not more is always, that more is not always better. A very good example is in the field of patents. Patents are a good thing, as I explained. They can stimulate research and development, stimulate innovation. But if you give patents to just about any kind of invention, how simple and trivial, how infantile you can imagine, then this patent system undermines itself. And, the tr and I could give many examples of that. But I think the best example here, of course, is what's going on all over the world now, the patent war between Samsung and Apple, or I should say between Apple and Samsung, and I'm sure many of you have heard about that. This is a battle, a patent battle being fought in the United States, in Japan, all over Europe probably also in Russia, but I, don't, I would like to hear more about that. 
And it's all about the two main competitors in the field of smartphones basically throwing very trivial patents, very simple patents against each other. This slide is a, is a good illustration. Look at, maybe you can't really read it, but the kind of patents that they are talking about are incredibly obvious, I would say. All these are summaries of patents that the two parties are, are, are opposing to each other. Here's a patent on the idea of an automatic bounce-back feature when scrolling beyond the edge of a page. You go, you, I mean, we're totally used to this now. You go on your iPhone or on your Android, you go to the, to the side, and then it, the page comes back. This has been patented. Even the idea of patenting that is already original, I would say. That's an Apple patent. And then there's this one. Enlarging a document by tipping the screen. Here's a Samsung patent. A method allowing multitasking while playing music on the phone. Brilliant, isn't it? And I could give many other examples. All these patents are pulled into packages that are, and both sides are throwing these patents at each other. Apple shouts infringement against Samsung and Samsung against Apple. And this is not good for innovation, I can tell you. It is very bad. There are many other examples of trivial patents and it is one of the big problems of patent law as we speak. And there are actually websites devoted to funny patents, ridiculous patents, wacky patents. And um, I'm sure you've seen some of them. This is my personal favorite. This, it's not in the field of electronics, obviously. This is a patent which uh, provides a device for protecting the ears of animals, especially long-haired dogs, from becoming soiled by the animal's food. There are, of course, many other examples. The idea here is that you clip the ears of this poodle and then the poodle keeps clean while eating. Brilliant. I could give many other examples. The point is, of course, that there are too many trivial patents around. And the point, is, and, and where that comes from is that patent, the uh, patent systems all over the world have a tendency to become less critical, to allow more and more patents into the system because the examiners that need to grant these patents are always overworked and they usually get paid on the basis of how many patents they grant. So in the end, they just think, oh, that looks interesting patented. It becomes a bureaucracy. There are other examples where overprotection stifles innovation. Copyright in computer algorithms is another example. Database rights in data sets that can only be derived from a single source are another example. Uh, in fact, a very good example or a bad example here in, in Europe, almost everywhere in Europe, there is litigation, and you cannot imagine that how important this, lit this is, about the match fixtures of the British Premier League. Not the results, but when the clubs are playing each other. There are copyright claims, database right claims being litigated all over Europe, particularly in the United Kingdom, but also elsewhere, about protecting that. Is that valuable? Is that worth something? Yes, it is, because on the basis of these fixtures, match fixtures, a whole betting industry all over Europe is making a lot of money. And the Premier League wants money from the betting industry. So they are monopolizing the match fixtures. They're asking huge royalties for that. Is that good for innovation? Is that good for cultural progress? I don't think so. I think these are typical examples of data that should be free in the public domain and should not be the subject of any exclusive right. I think that's particularly important for scientists. So 
there are other areas where intellectual property is not working well. Here's another area where intellectual property rights are simply abused, where they are put to use for purely strategic purposes, not to reward inventors, not to reward authors, not to promote science and the useful arts, but as a strategic tool, for instance, to prevent the market entry of new competitors. And this is a serious problem with patents again. Patents increasingly are being used as to create obstacles to new entries to the market, to new players. If you are in the software industry, you will have encountered so-called patent thickets. Patent thickets are basically large stacks of patents, sometimes thousands of patents owned by one and the same industry that are there only to prevent you from entering a certain market. Some of these patents are no good, others are good. You don't know, but you don't have the money, you don't have the lawyers, you don't have the knowledge to know what's good about them and what is not. So you decide in the end to stay away from that market. This is a strategic way of protecting competitive advantages in many markets and it is considered by many as a really bad part of the patent system. And what is even worse is when patent thickets become so-called patent trolls or even copyright trolls nowadays exist. What are they? Well, you know what trolls are? These scary, well, dwarfs from Norway? Well, these are not from Norway. These are scary rights holders from all over the world who buy copyrights from other people or buy patents from other people, from companies. Patents that sometimes are not worth a lot, but they buy lots of them. And the only reason they do that is to bother other companies and basically blackmail them into paying royalty fees. Patent trolls are an increasingly, problem, increasingly problematic in all sectors of innovation. Maybe you've already experienced this. Suddenly you get a letter from a company saying, your product infringes our patents number this, this, this and that. And you are sure that you're not infringing any patent. But you don't have the money, you don't have the lawyer, you don't have the patience to litigate. So in the end, you pay them off. This is blackmail, this is trolls, and it's a serious problem. The use of intellectual property to extract money from existing users. This is not to promote the progress of science and useful arts. This is not good for innovation. Excessive pricing, of course, is another abusive practice. These are all examples of why it is very important for the intellectual property system to balance, to create a balance between exclusive right and freedom, open access. So this is essential in any intellectual property system. Intellectual property only works if it is balanced. If there are rights protected, but at the same time they cannot be abused. If the rights are protected just enough to promote innovation and creativity, but not too much that it will stifle that, that it will impede it. And there are various ways to do that. And for the lawyers, this is the interesting part, but you're not lawyers, so I, I will run through this rather quickly. There are some, there are different ways to create balance in a system by excluding, for instance, certain subject matter, certain aspects of intellectual creation that you can never make into an intellectual property right. So in copyright, for instance, we have a rule which says there is no copyright in abstract ideas. There's no copyright in theories. There's no copyright in facts. All this is free. In patents, we also have exclusions. We have a rule in Europe, 
but not in the United States, which excludes computer programs from patenting. There's a rule in the European Patent Convention which says there is no patents available for computer programs as such. Now, it's a difficult rule because what does as such mean? Does that mean that they're really ruled out or does it mean that you can still get patents for computer programs in combination with hardware? Well, the answer is probably yes. But it's an example that not anything goes. There are other things excluded also, diagnostic methods, met medical operations, that is basically, are ruled out, and there are other examples too. So that's important, but what is at least as important for balancing is limitations and exceptions, limits to the exclusive right. In copyright, particularly a good copyright system has sufficient limitations and exceptions, free uses. In the United States, they say fair uses. To allow breathing space in the system, to allow other creators to use parts of works without permission, so they can be creative themselves. A few examples here. Most countries have private copying exceptions, which allow private copying without permission. Many countries allow educational uses. So I would be allowed, for instance, your students, I would be allowed to give you copies of articles as part of the curriculum of the Skolkovo Open University. In patents, we have a freedom for that allows experimental use on patented inventions without permission. But these limitations and exceptions are very often under pressure. Under pressure by intellectual property owners who want to, de to limit them, who say this is piracy. But it's not piracy, it's essential breathing space in t inside the system. And then there are other rules that are also very important, particularly in the field of patents. Compulsory licensing, which allows a state agent or a court to force a license upon a patent owner who abuses his intellectual property, who asks excessive prices, for instance. If you don't have that, the patent system can be abused. And finally, of course, what is also very important is the limited term. Intellectual property is not like normal property. Normal property is in principle endless, perpetual. If your family owns a castle, your great, 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 great grandchildren will still own that castle, or it may be owned by someone else, but the ownership doesn't disappear. Intellectual property lasts relatively short time. Copyright 70 years after the death of the author, Patents much, much shorter, 20 years after the initial application. So with these short terms are also mechanisms of balancing intellectual property. Finally, there are areas where copyright becomes basically irrelevant. Here too, I have a few examples. One example is when enforcement is basically not possible. And in copyright, we have a lot of those examples. Enforcing copyright through legal mechanisms, through litigation or through sending letters from lawyers is not possible everywhere where copyright works are used. An example, again, is private copying. Everyone does it. And even if it were not allowed, everyone would be doing it anyway. And it's impossible to enforce. This is another example. This is what we all do. We send emails to our friends, to our colleagues. Look at this article. Look at this picture. Look at this nice bit of music. Technically, that is an infringement. But well, we all do it. Who cares? The reality is that you 
cannot enforce your rights everywhere in copyright. And I think the most critical example is here, peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. In the Netherlands, I teach copyright to law students. And at the beginning of a course, I always ask them, confess, who of you is illegally file sharing? Every year, more hands go up. Last year, I didn't ask that anymore. I asked the opposite. I asked, who of you is not file sharing? And then only one hand went up. And I asked, why are you not file sharing? And it was a girl, and she said, I don't know how to file share. Um, in other words, if law students do it, everyone does this until, of course, I don't do it. I'm a copyright professor, but many other people do. What do we do about it? Technically, it's an infringement, but we can't enforce. Well, the copyright industries, the record companies, they try to enforce it against internet service providers, against individuals sometimes, but it's not working. Every year, people keep downloading like never before. Maybe it's time to just forget about this part of intellectual property. Maybe it's better. And I personally believe that where enforcement is not possible to simply allow these things. We've already done that with private copying. Why don't we just accept that we have file sharing? We can't do much about it. What we could do is do something that we have done before in copyright in other fields, replace the exclusive right by a right to remuneration. You basically allow file sharing, like we did with private copying, but guarantee some money for authors as a matter of compensation through, collective, through collecting societies. This is a mechanism that exists all over Europe for private copying. And we could expand it, perhaps, and there's a lot of discussion going on about that in Europe and even in the United States to expand it to file sharing and other unauthorized uses. Anyway, there are other areas where intellectual property is also basically irrelevant or you could say unnecessary. And that, of course, is where copying is, and that's quite the opposite of the example I was just talking about, where copying is basically impossible. We don't need intellectual property in a field where reproduction is prohibitively difficult. We actually only have intellectual property in areas where copying is easy. So whenever you see intellectual property in areas where copying has become difficult, you may wonder, do we really need an intellectual property right? My favorite example here, semiconductor chip design. This is, I'm talking about this here. Oh, that's not a very nice slide. It's much nicer on my laptop, I can tell you. But you know what I'm showing you here. This is the design of a a chip, the layout of a chip. It's very complicated with lots of little avenues and streets and looks a bit like the like a map of Moscow, New York from from a satellite. Very complicated and very difficult to copy. This kind of intellectual property does not need protection under the law because it is impossible to copy at low expense. There is no piracy in this field. And I'm telling you this with, for a good reason. We actually have laws protecting semiconductor chip design all over the world. And I'm sure you have such a law as well. Every country that I know has a law protecting this, and no one is copying. Why do we have these laws? I don't think we need them. You could say the same about content that is protected through digital rights management or 
protected behind paywalls, there's a lot of stuff that you can simply not copy, even if it's on the internet. Why do we need intellectual property there? I don't think we need it. We could do with a lot less. And then, of course, and now we're near the end of this story, there is a lot of creation and innovation going on that does not need the incentive, the reward of an intellectual property right in the first place. Because there are other motivating factors at work. Where creation and invention needs no incentive because it just happens, why do we need an intellectual property? Right. <coughs> Amateur creation is a good example. Look on the internet, all the photos, all the poems, all the music made by amateur artists, they do not need a copyright. They just want to show how creative they are and express themselves to the world. A better example, think of science, scientists. Scientists don't need the motivation of an intellectual property. We want to be published. We want to show the world how clever we are. We don't need exclusive rights. Think of bloggers. They don't need copyright. They'll blog anyway without the copyright. And think of open source software. There are different motivators at work here. And that, of course, brings me to open content, open source, open access, open data. These expressions, these models are often used interchangeably. They are sometimes confusing. They don't mean exactly the same, but they roughly mean the same. What they all refer to is a model where intellectual property rights are not the essence of the business model, where openness, where sharing, where copying is the essence of the model. It is the reverse of intellectual property. It is a business model, or I shouldn't call it a business model. It's a model of creation and innovation that sets the whole intellectual property paradigm on its head. And it comes in different flavors. Open content. Open content usually refers to works, film, music, books that may be freely copied and distributed. And the example here probably well known to you, Creative Commons. Creative Commons is 10 years old now. It's an American project, but it's spread all over the world. And it provides for open content licenses in a number of variants, but they all have in common that works may be reutilized without permission, without payment by anyone in the world. Uh, the different uh, flavors of uh, Creative Commons uh, are symbolized by these nice little icons. And I don't think we need to go into them also because we're running out of time a bit. Roughly speaking, this means if you see this sign, you will have to mention the author's name. This means you cannot put the work to commercial use. This means you're allowed to make modifications, but only if you give the work back to others for further use. Creative Commons has become immensely popular. If you look for the, on the internet, you will see hundreds of millions of works marked with these signs showing that you can use them for free, open content. Then there's open source, and you're probably more familiar with that. Open source is where it all began. Software that may be used, modified, redistributed freely without payment. A model coming again in different flavors. There's the free software, there's the copyleft variant. This is the pioneer. This is where it all started, the GNU operating system which was uh, made available under a free software license, but there are many 
for Ryan's here. Extremely important. Linux, of course, is the flag carrier here. Open access. Open access usually refers to scientific publications that are made available for everyone, again, for free, again, without an intellectual property behind it. Open access is uh, uh, a broad notion. Sometimes it's used to describe open source, open content, open data as a all-encompassing notion, but in fact it is particularly relevant in the context of scientific publication. There's a, a famous Berlin Declaration which describes open access as on this slide. And open data. Open data re usually refers to government data that are being made available for free, data sets. If you go to the um, data.gov site of the United States, for instance, there will be hundreds, thousands of data sets freely available for use, freely available not only for scientific use, but even for commercialization. And more and more countries in the world are, are having different, uh, similar projects where government data are made freely available. Here are a few examples. Australia, the Netherlands, US, but I could give many other examples. It's official Dutch government policy now to make data sets freely available under a Creative Commons license. And Australia is another example there. So where does this system work well? Well, in a lot of areas. This system of open content or open source or open access. Where reputation is more important than profit. Open content works really well. This is true for science, for education, for new creators, new artists. Open content works well where collaboration yields immediate benefits to those who collaborate. Wikipedia is the example here, but open source is another. And it also works really well in businesses where investment in creation and innovation can be recouped through ancillary services, derivative services. This is why open source software companies can commercially survive. They can't make money from the software, but they can make money on their reputation as a, as a service or support industry. And the same is true to a degree for authors that perform themselves. Rock groups make a lot of more money nowadays from performing than from owning copyrights. Here's some examples. Flickr. All the photos on Flickr are available under a Creative Commons license nowadays. And that's hundreds of thousands of often very good photos, even from Moscow. Wikipedia, another successful example. All the content of Wikipedia is now available under a Creative Commons license. Linux, of course, the ultimate success story of open source. Red Hat, company making money off open source. It's a commercial company. There's nothing ideologic about it. They're making money on the basis of Red Hat management solutions, so services based on open source, but they're not making money off the open source. And then this, oh, this slide is really awful again. This is gr the Grateful Dead. It's the original example of open content, even before Creative Commons existed. This band of hippies, now there are, half of them are now dead, by the way, uh, used to make money by handing out cassettes to everyone. They just stimulated reproduction and said, come to our concerts. And whatever content you have, you may give to your friends. It's the opposite of the intellectual property business model, but it worked really well for them. So, does that mean that open access and open content and open source always works? No. 
it works in some areas and in increasing numbers of areas relevant to your field, innovation and creation. But there are areas where it doesn't. And that's the main message I have for you today. In some areas, you really need intellectual property. In other areas, open access, open content, open source is more than enough. And another conclusion, and this is the end of my story, if you think about it, both systems, although they look like opposites, have the same aim, ideally. Promoting innovation, promoting creation through very different angles, through very different models. One is exclusivity, royalties. The other one, openness, reputation, fame. And both have their pros and both have their cons. And another part of the story, of course, is that whatever you do, we need balance in IP. IP, intellectual property that is unbalanced, that it becomes too strong, that becomes too one-sided, can stifle innovation, can undermine its aim of promoting science, promoting creativity. We need space. We need flexibility for follow-on creation, for follow-on innovation. And that, I think, is an essential weakness of the intellectual property system, that intellectual property basically presumes a right. If you do nothing, if you create and you do nothing, you get a copyright. This is no good. What would be much better if you do nothing, like apply for a copyright or you get no right, that you need to apply for the copyright. Like you have in patents. In patents, you, you only get a patent if you apply for it. But with copyright, you just create and you get the right. So every second, millions of rights are generated by the law. Most of them irrelevant, unnecessary, superfluous, some of them obstructive. This is not very good. So what we should consider, perhaps, for the future is a mechanism of restoring formalities in copyright. I could go on for a while, but I think I'm well over my time, so uh, I'd leave it here. Uh, thank you for your attention. I would uh, love to uh, take some questions if we have uh, time for that. I think we have a couple of minutes, yes? Jane. Uh, of course we have some time, and the единственная просьба, все вопросы в микрофон. Uh, any question? Yeah. We have in our room a pro IP advocate sitting there. Um, maybe Iskandar, would you like to raise a discussion? Maybe. Not really pro IP, but the issue is that reintroducing copyright formalities could be, in theory, useful, but only in case we do it universally by international treaty. In case we reintroduce copyright formalities on national level only, it will create international unfair competition. Because no every author which wants to protect his copyright would be able to register it in the United States, as it was uh, by the beginning of 80s or 90s, I don't remember. Until the end of the 80s, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe it's it's not the question, but it's just a comment that situation is not really clear, and we need to understand that any changes now shall be done globally. If we introduce any changes on national level, it uh, it doesn't create balance. I agree with you that it would be better to do this uh, internationally all at once. So in principle, I totally agree with you. Copyright is a system that needs to be more or less uniform at the global level, especially with the internet, of course, with copyright. We are so connected with each other, the markets are connected, that it would be good to have the same rules all over the place. Having said that, I also think if we want to reform copyright and whatever kind of reform we like, 
we sometimes need to take bold steps within a country to trigger the international debate because changes usually not come from the top but usually go bottom up. Uh, in, the, in the past, uh, innovation in the field of uh, intellectual property always comes from one country or a couple of countries who do something different and then it becomes a treaty. It's very difficult. So, in principle, I agree with you, but in practice, it will not work like that. In practice, I think if we want to change things, we should start somewhere in a country that, that dares. Let's call it Iceland. And then from there, it spreads to another country. And then another. Or maybe we can call it Russia. Uh, there's another reason why I'm saying this. And you know, of course, why I'm saying that. With formalities, we're bound by an existing international treaty which does not like formalities. The Berne Convention and the TRIPS Agreement repeats that formalities are not allowed. So if we want to experiment here, we can only do it at the national level because the Berne Convention does allow national solutions, uh, but not internet. Anyway, it's not easy to change the law. But this is just a small part of my whole story, of course. Other questions in the back? In Russia, uh, Russia's uh, uh, intellectual uh, property right does not give uh, patents to algorithms, whilst we know that in the US uh, they do have patents for algorithms. And uh, what's the situation in Europe? And the next question, if I may. Uh, is there any protection of uh, uh, software by design? Is there any place where there is such protection? I'm not speaking about uh, their uh, registration of software, but I'm speaking about the design of software products. Like architecture. Um. Uh, let's start with the first question. The first question is, is there, how, how, how does Europe treat algorithms? Um, so that's a difficult question. Of course, we have two areas where software can be protected, copyright, patents. In copyright, theoretically speaking, algorithms are ideas and therefore not copyright protectable. I say in theory, because it is very difficult sometimes to distinguish between the algorithms and the code. They can, especially since copyright can be rather expensive. But we've had an in interesting and important decision uh, this year by the European Court of Justice in the SAS programming case, where a claim to protect the logic of a, the internal logic of a programming solution by copyright was rejected by the European Court. So I think the quick answer to a part of your question that is in Europe, there is no copyright protection for software algorithms. Now the other part is patents. As I told you in, in my presentation, in the uh, European Patent Convention, there's an exclusion for copy computer programs as such. So that suggests that algorithmic solutions as such can never be subject to a patent either. On the other hand, the European Patent Office does accept patents for software related inventions where sometimes the novel aspect is really an algorithm. So indirectly, there is some protection for algorithms. 
But it is not like in the United States, where the United States uh, is much more open to, to this kind of invention than in Europe. So the, in Europe, it's difficult, I would say, for patents. Now, the second question, I didn't really understand. Architecture, is that, are you talking about the logical structure of a computer program? The, the, mo the, the modular, the, uh, the way the different modules interact with each other. Yeah, it, that, I think the answer depends on whether you can call that the expression, expressive features of a program or whether that is the unprotected logic. It's, there are no decisions on that particular issue by the European Court. There are some indications that this would be called part of the uh, protected expression. Let me give you a quick answer. I don't know. <laughs> Depends. We have Europe, we don't have, we have uh, 27 countries in Europe and we have hundreds of courts. Some courts would say yes and other courts would say no. That's the quick answer. I can give you a very long answer too, but time is running out. It's an interesting question. If you don't mind asking a question to abuse my right. No, please. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that uh, for some industries, like production of uh, uh, large-scale intellectual products, so like mm. movies, uh, yeah. IP regime is necessary. Yeah. But uh, I want to ask, uh, what do you think? In current uh, state of movie industry, uh, is IP regime promoting useful art or to a certain extent uh, uh, incentivize industrial groups like Hollywood uh, studios to create something else which is basically motivated by the greed itself, not by uh, the desire to build a new creative or uh, beautiful objects uh, and uh, is it currently a useful art and if we get rid of IP protection in movie industry mm. wouldn't we get better movies I mean or at least uh, get rid of uh, not good movies uh, I see what I, I know what you're saying well we would certainly get rid of the James Bond kind of movies although in the in defense of your proposition, or not, that's not your proposition, but you could argue, of course, that we don't even need intellectual property for James Bond movies, because if you look at the income sheet, I haven't looked at, at it, but I've been a, a lawyer in the past, and I know this industry a bit, you might find that a lot of the money being made on Skyfall, for instance, comes from sponsoring. If you went to the movie, you would have seen them drinking a lot of soft drinks all the time in the movie and that's not for nothing because they're getting a lot of money for advertising basically so there are other ways of financing but uh, generally speaking I do think if we did not have copyright we would not have these large-scale productions they would not be you couldn't finance them to start with film financing is where films start and you could never go to a bank and say I want to develop this new a uh, $100 million movie without some kind of a right that they could bank against. They need that. You've been a lawyer too. You know how it works. So, is that bad? <coughs> mm, that depends on your world view, I guess. I personally like going to James Bond movies, but I also like to go to really complicated, low-budget movies uh, that might actually be produced without copyright more easily. Uh, there's a whole industry uh, in, in Europe, particularly in France, but also in other parts of uh, Europe, in the Netherlands too, where, where films are basically made on the basis of state subsidies. See, that could work, especially for smaller movies. The, the highest budget you could raise in the Netherlands that way is 5 million euros. So you would get a different kind of movie. Maybe, maybe artistically speaking better, but you wouldn't get your James Bond movie that draws uh, millions of people to the, audience, to, the, to the cinemas. Okay, is that a big loss? Maybe, maybe not. 
what would be a big loss if, if we would reduce incentives, for instance, for the pharmaceutical industry to pump large amounts of money in research and development. Okay, you could say, yeah, but we could also have the state pay for that. Indirectly, of course, the state is already paying through all the legal, the, all the medical bills. So we could all revent it. We could revent a world around intellectual property. It might look a bit more like uh, Russia 20 years ago, but it could also be working to a degree. There are people who say, yeah, even in, in pharmaceuticals, maybe uh, government sponsoring would be better. I think in the short while, there are some areas here where, where it actually works. That's my opinion. But I see your point. Other questions? Uh, in Russian Civil Code, in the IP section of Russian Civil Code, there is this object named uh, know-how or trade secret. Yes. What, which is literally from the Russian Civil Code, it's production secret. Yeah. Uh, to my knowledge uh, it's uh, well the protection of uh, trade secrets differs in different jurisdictions like here in Russia it's protected by the civil legislation in some juris jurisdictions it's protected by entire monopoly well actually no I mean the other p yes uh, legal relations are regulated by entire monopoly regulations uh, and also to my knowledge well the coca-cola formula is protected under this type of uh, and the trade secret. Uh, what would you say here? How to well, does this system need some re deregulation or? Oh, that's a very difficult one. The first question, of course, is: Is trade secret protection is that intellectual property at all? Uh, in my pers if we look at my view on intellectual property, I don't think so. The whole idea about intellectual property is that you create an exclusive right as a reward for sharing information yeah, and you, with the you world. Open it, but this you information is yeah. by default it's secret. Yeah, so I would not call that intellectual property, although I know that in some systems, including the American system, that is, in, they, they consider it as intellectual property. I think the, uh, the aims and the rationales are completely different here. Um, uh, so I don't think... Uh, I don't see the positives of trademark, uh, trade secret protection the way uh, I, I see it in, in the field of intellectual property. I actually, the, you, you, um, there, are, there are obvious dangers here in, in creating uh, uh, legal monopolies on the basis of, uh, uh, of not sharing information. This is, you, you could argue, uh, even worse than a, an, an overprotective intellectual property system. Um, on the other hand, if you would get rid of intellectual property, this is probably the only thing you have. This is, by the way, uh, one of the arguments in favor of intellectual property. Um, critis critics of intellectual property, and I'm one of them, uh, are often told, imagine a world without any intellectual property. What would happen then? What would you do? Well, you could do open source and open access and open everything, but that doesn't always work, as we have seen. What would a big company do, a big pharmaceutical company or electronics manufacturer? They would keep everything secret that they would develop. They would not share their knowledge. They would create huge amounts of secret information. Is that better for the world? So I'm not a big fan of trade secret protection, to be honest. And conceptually, I don't think it's intellectual property. Does that mean that uh, we should do away with it? Well, no. But I wouldn't call it, I wouldn't put it in the same pot, so to speak. I think, I think we're looking, I think trade secret protection is, is, is much more part of unfair competition law. Stealing other people's secret is not a good idea, but giving it a special status in the law, I'm not so sure is that, that that's a very good idea. Because there's no trade-off here. There's no exceptions. There's no limitations. So, anyway, I'm not sure I'm answering your question. <laughs> I don't think so. so I had one more question. Sorry. So, pe pe people told me once that one of the biggest mistakes of IBM was to allow 
Bill Gates inside IBM PC. And uh, because uh, through the windows, Bill Gates uh, more or less uh, became controlling IBM PC sales. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, the question is uh, the following. For example, if, if we talk about um, uh, Creative Commons or other systems of protection of software, not by copyright or patent, who would be beneficiary of that? And will uh, countries like Russia, who have a big IT sector, win out of that? So we produce a lot of software, we produce a lot of good software, but we do not produce any hardware. And if we don't have control over hardware market and hardware production, what would be our, uh, how to say, our strong side in this case? Oh, that's a that's a very good question. Uh, all the questions are very good, but this is, I think, very relevant. Uh, my quick answer would be uh, that you would benefit hugely from an open source model, uh, assuming that you are good at software and software-related services, and that at the same time you are not capable of controlling this platform. Um, monopolizing it the way Bill Gates has done, then you have a lot to gain by a gro growth in a service, in a software service related industry which uh, builds on open, so open, uh, open solutions that uh, uh, are developed everywhere, any, anywhere in the world. Uh, Red Hat is the example. I mean, uh, it builds on Linux. Linux is available for everyone. You're good at that. You're good at a lot of things, obviously, but uh, um, I can imagine that that might actually be a much more beneficial model for you than a very proprietary model where you... Uh, yeah, you would need... Uh, I can't, well, it's very, it's very difficult to predict uh, developments in, in, in IT. I mean, Windows, uh, even Windows is now crumbling. But uh, I would find it very difficult for a non-American uh, competitor to come up with the new Windows that monopolizes the world. I don't see that. So my guess is you would, you would have a lot to gain from open source. But I haven't analyzed your industry, so I'm just, this is just a guess. Because if you don't have, if you don't have intellectual property mm. and you don't have money, mm. usually wins the one who has money. And the United States or China have money. Mm. They have financial uh, power compared to us. Yeah, but you have uh, intellectual power, right? And software industry doesn't is relatively low in in in, in investment costs if you compare to other industries. And you have a lot of well-developed capacity there. I would guess uh, there's a lot of potential here. But it is easy yeah. to imagine that American capital comes and buys everything mm -hmm. after that. And buys at the price of labor, not at the price of special property. So it is easy to imagine that uh, in that case, capital American or Chinese will come and buy uh, all that software industry companies in Russia and they will buy it at the price of the labor and not at the price of industrial property which is more than price of the pure labor. Yeah, maybe. So. But if you develop a strong services industry based on open source, you could develop very strong brands, which could be uh, capitalized as well. Anyway, I'm not an economist, but my guess is that uh, against, if you, you're, if you want to compete against uh, the United States, I wouldn't follow the same model. That would be my quick and intuitive answer. Uh, it's the same in Europe. Uh, you some, 
30 years ago, the European Commission always advised us to do exactly what the US is doing. Now, it's the reverse. Open source is very, you see it almost in every, in every document by the European Commission now, because the main monopolists are in the US. We should do the opposite. That's my, and I think I agree with that. And this is, uh, oh, it's become a big policy everywhere. Open source is uh, heavily promoted all over Europe, at the European level, but also at the national level. Governments make policies out of it. Will it work? We'll, we'll know in a couple of years, of course, but uh, I, think it's, I think the developments are promising. But this is just uh, speculation, of course. The short question to do yeah. on this yeah. uh, topic of IT, sorry, uh, growth, uh, in the, uh, industry, IT industry growth in the United States. Uh, what do you think? Uh, didn't they benefit a lot from the fair use doctrine they could rely on in development of new products? I mean, in Silicon Valley and uh, all these companies like uh, Microsoft, uh, uh, wasn't it like competitive advantage they had uh, in the US? which uh, European companies didn't have in this period of uh, active IT growth? There's, uh, there are strong indications that uh, new, uh, that innovation is, uh, is stimulated by an environment of openness. And uh, if you look at the history of Silicon Valley, you won't see patents popping up in the early stage. You will not see copyright cases. You will see an environment in, in where a lot of information is shared, basically, f between companies that later become very fierce competitors. And I think there's, uh, apart from the legal uh, background, which which you mentioned, fair use is of course uh, an important factor there. In the United States, copyright isn't less strict than it is in some other areas, some other countries like Russia, for instance. You don't have a fair use rule here which allows a lot of freedom in your copyright. But it's, it, it's also the scientific environment, I think, uh, the mentality of these developments. Developers, they all come from, from or they all came from, uh, from universities originally. Sharing is much more important there than, than owning intellectual property. So um, yes, it's, uh, if you want to replicate that model, create a, a world where companies can operate in, uh, in, in a similar uh, open environment and uh, Having some freedom under intellectual property, I'm sure, will help. Um, there are uh, some right holders in Russia who um, are very disappointed by the fact that there is a, there is a lot of um, digital distributing uh, of the uh, copyrighted material over the internet and they can control this process. So they, uh, they have this material and then they come over to the computer and find uh, that the copyrighted material is distributed freely. And uh, so they came up with the idea of the general state government registry of the copyrighted material, of the content. Uh, so uh, suppose I'm an author uh, and I wrote a piece of uh, something, some text. So I come to this uh, regist registry and I uh, upload it to this um, and get a fingerprints of this, uh, of my bit of text. text. Um, then I go to the internet, find uh, pieces of uh, uh, my bit of text, text uh, without the fingerprints, and then I can sue. Um, uh, the, the internet provider, the, the provider of these texts, um, due to this, uh, to my registry. What do you think of that idea? There's, uh, 
Some of this is already happening in, uh, not through uh, regulation, but uh, you could call it self-regulation. Uh, there's a content management system working on YouTube now, which recognizes music, which recognizes video files. And you probably have noticed this if you are uploading stuff that is infringing, you get an automatic warning. And, uh, it's, it's, it's blocked, and so there are, uh, Google is actually very uh, advanced in, in doing this in collaboration with right holders in, uh, in a, lot, a large part, uh, particularly in the United States, but also in Europe. So this is already happening, and it works with fingerprinting uh, of music and, and video files, and works reasonably well. Uh, do you, if you institutionalize that, uh, would that be even better? Um, there's a risk about in, inherent in these systems, which uh, um, makes me to think twice about such systems. The risk is, and I think uh, some examples with YouTube actually demonstrate that, that sometimes infringing content is taken down automatically without a real infringement occurring. Um, if, you, if you put, in other words, if you put copyright enforcement into the hands of a robot, basically, there is a risk that what looks like an infringement to a robot is actually a, f a fair use. Um, if I put a lecture on YouTube and I show, as an example, a film, a clip of a film, it might be taken down automatically through this filtering system, but it is a totally legal use, a fair use, in fact, a quotation, which is allowed even under Russian law. Um, is that good? I think that's a bit dangerous. I think more generally it's a bit dangerous to leave uh, copyright enforcement to uh, computer technology uh, to, to such a degree. What I do like about the proposal is that it, it reminds me a bit of what I, I, I advocate at the end. Perhaps we do need some more registries of copyright to make copyright more of a applied right, a right that you positively need to seek rather than a right that is a default that is there automatically. So I see pros and cons. So the intellectual property protection can be the in instrument to create a monopoly position. Mm -hmm. And your example about the battle between the Apple and Samsung, I think, is much about this. Can you mention any examples when the IP property protection uh, was limited because of uh, competition law purposes? Maybe some cases, maybe some ideas. Yeah. So, thank you. Um. It's relatively rare that it happens, that intellect, that competition authorities intervene. That's what you're looking at. Uh, but I can give you, uh, let, me get, let me see, there, there are a number of cases in uh, this, the European Commission, I think, uh, has a track record of intervening with intellectual property on certain occasions. Um, the first famous case about uh, abuse of dominance in the field of uh, uh, ICT, which is probably your main interest here, of course, the IBM antitrust case, which is already how old is that now? 30 years old, maybe even more. 
uh, that never led to a, a decision by the European Court, but it was a, a, a huge decision by the European Commission. But this, these were the days when IBM was still the dominant player. Much more recently, of course, and I'm sure you, you know this case uh, as well as the Microsoft was slapped by the European Commission for an enormous fine because it was abusing um, copyright and other intellectual property rights in Windows, in the Windows operating platform, to basically deny access to a downstream market for workgroup server uh, products and services. They were basically not allowing anyone else into that market by denying requests for information to allow intercompatibility. Uh, and by doing so, they basically destroyed this market for, for all the other players. In the, in the early days, there were companies like Novell, who were very active in the workgroup server market. They were pushed out by Microsoft basically by constantly changing the specifications of the Windows server operating system and not telling Novell so that clients had to move to Microsoft. Uh, the commission did not like it, warned Microsoft several times, and then in the end they got an enormous fine for abusing intellectual property. Those are, that is the, last, the Microsoft case is the most spectacular one. Uh, it led to an a fine of more than, a, more than a billion, that's one with nine zeros, euros, and uh, even more fines came afterward because they're, not they're still not complying with that, with that decision. Now, uh, there are other cases. The commission is now after Google, but I don't, I don't know that story. So, okay, so it happens. Does it happen a lot? No. Why not? It's incredibly difficult. One competition law case in competition case in the field of intellectual property can take years. Hundreds of lawyers. Well, you probably have the same here in Russia. The competition cases are always very complicated. With intellectual property, it's even more. What is a market? What is a derivative market? What what is a reasonable price? It is it's not the best way to cure the system. My I personally believe that it's much better to have a intellectual property system that is less protective and that does not require going to the competition authorities all the time because the competition authorities, they, they cannot handle these cases. And, um, so it's a, a last resort kind of a solution. Don't rely too much on competition law. That's my experience. Не могли бы вы уточнить, э, нужно ли какую-либо вводить э, коррективы в, в вопросы интеллектуальной собственности в связи с развитием краудфандинга? Я, что я имею в виду? Вот, ну, все мы знаем э, ряд известных сайтов, как Kickstarter, так сказать, и так далее, в Штатах, и в Англии, немножко в Европе и чуть-чуть совсем в России. Есть ли какие-то есть ли какие-то проблемы в их процессе? Ну, например, я So, uh, could you please explain uh, whether there are any plans uh, to introduce uh, intellectual uh, property uh, with the development of uh, crowdfunding? Uh, Например, допустим, я хочу собрать не очень большую сумму финансирования на создание какого-то полезного продукта. So uh, let's, I want uh, to uh, get a small amount of money to fund some product. Для этого я раскрываю более, more or less, так сказать, их, его характеристики и обещаю людям, которые 
участникам краудфандинга, которые могут мне захотеть дать деньги, 1 доллар, 10 долларов, 1000 долларов, что я рано или поздно это сделаю, и он появится на рынке. С одной стороны, тут, ну, как я вижу, это две проблемы. Первое, я уже в значительной степени рассказал то, что я хочу сделать. У меня, допустим, у меня нет патента до момента моего а, 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 паблик публикования моей заявки. Любой, кто увидел мою идею, имеет полное право ее воспроизвести. И у меня нет никакой патентной защиты. Хорошо, допустим, второй вариант. У меня есть ноу-хау который я каким-то хитрым образом скрыл в моем э, технологическом предложении, собрав э, 100 тысяч долларов, ну, обычная сумма для краудфайла, для текстартера, я делаю 1, 2, 3, 4 опытных образца, и далее я иду, естественно, к венчурному или к любому другому капиталисту. И он, естественно, будучи венчурным капиталистом, говорит, а где, э, знает ли об этом кто-то еще? Я говорю, об этом реально знает Пол Америки. Ну, извини, дорогой. Вот как мне быть, с одной стороны, процесс вроде хороший, краудфандинг, достаточно демократичный и укладывается в идею open source, с другой стороны, отсутствие, в общем-то, каких-либо прав у меня на в принципе, придуманную мною интеллектуальную собственность, но раскрытую для поиска финансирования, мне дальше блокирует в сущности мои, мои прибыли. Generally, uh, sometimes the idea behind an invention or behind a creation that is copyrightable is the most valuable, of. and that is the li and at the same time in intellectual property the idea as such is the least protectable. There is no copyright for an idea. There is no patent. What you can get is a patent for an applied idea. What you can get is a copyright for an expressed idea, but not the idea as such. So what you're describing with crowdfunding is already a problem, even without crowdfunding. I'm a television uh, format developer. I, I come up with this brilliant idea. Let's. Uh, Let's select 10 crazy people from the street and put them in a studio, lock the door, and film them day and night and see what happens. That's Big Brother. But it's just an idea. If I tell you, please finance this, you will say, oh, good idea. Well, I'll call you later. And this, is, this happens all the time in television. Ideas are being stolen constantly by developers. With crowdfunding, it's, of course, more problematic. On the other hand, the example that you give, if we're talking about investing in the, expo in the marketing of a patentable invention, it's not so problematic. What you do is, of course, Don't advertise your invention before you have done the application, because then you're shooting yourself in the foot. But after the application, even before you get the patent, there's no problem, because you are protected from the point of application. You don't have to wait until you get the patent. So you can apply and then crowdfund. You can do that. Never do it the other way around, of course. Then you're This is the classic mistake that everyone makes in, uh, in, 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 in any kind of industry. Oh, look what I invented. Let's invite the media and then patent. It's always the wrong, that's the wrong order, obviously. Um, so I think it is possible. I don't think we need to change the law of intellectual property for crowdfunding. I don't think so. But I think we should be careful about when we start attracting the crowdfunding. First, do the application. You can even do a rudimentary application. It doesn't have to be a perfect one. You can always refine it afterward. And 
then you can start advertising. Look, I've invented this. Please send your money to me. Um, but that should be the right. I don't think we need a change of the law for that. I hope 